Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Why We Huddle. Today, we head back to the Power Four conferences and the Big Ten, as today we take a look at the Indiana Hoosiers. Once again, everyone, welcome to Why We Huddle. Uh, I'm Daniel, and with us today is Sammy Jacobs of the Hoosier Huddle Podcast. How are you doing, Sammy? I'm doing great, Dan. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for taking the time to come on and teach us a little bit about Indiana. Yeah, always happy to talk Indiana football, and, you know, season's less than 10 weeks away, so, you know, college football's almost here. Yep, and even that much closer as well to college football 25 releasing, which I know I'm getting excited about. I know that as time of this recording, they're supposed to drop the dynasty mode, like in depth look tomorrow. So, uh, which if you're listening, it's probably already out, but I know I'm excited. Are you excited, Sammy? I'm super excited. I have it pre-ordered on on the Xbox. I've been waiting. What has it been? 11 years since the, or 10 years since uh, NCAA 14 came out. So I'm, I'm excited to, you know, play this game. Xbox. Good man. Yeah. Uh, definitely looking forward to, I know there's going to be a college huddle uh, host like dynasty mode. So that'll definitely be interesting. Are you a part of that yet? I'm not a part of it yet. We've got a lot of things going on in, in life with a, a baby coming maybe next week. And, uh, you know, I don't want to commit to something that uh, I I don't want to get sinned through the year and get fired. Yeah, well, I I don't blame you. To be honest, I haven't sh- uh, signed up as a show host yet either. Mostly because I've not played Madden much in that big giant uh, gap of time between NCAA fourteen and now. I know it's not quite the Madden engine, but I know football games have evolved so. I don't want to embarrass myself. You know, we start playing games and I still don't know the controls. You know how it is. Yep. <laughs> so, all righty. Let's go ahead and get into it. Um, you know, when I think of Indiana, I'll be honest, I think of a basketball school. Today, we're here to talk football. What can you tell us about uh, Hoosier football? Well, it's, uh, as the recruits are calling it, uh, the new Indiana. Uh, Indiana's coming off a coaching change. They bring in Kirk Signetti after seven years of Tom Allen, who had some really good seasons and some really bad seasons. And his time had just run out in uh, in Bloomington, never really recovered after a 2021 season where they went 2-10. and 10. Uh, But he did take them to back-to-back, uh, you know, January Bowls in uh, 2019 at the Gator Bowl and then 2020 in the – now Re- rely a quest bowl, but the old outback bowl. Um, and then, you know, two and 10, four and eight, three and nine uh, have, ha- had not beaten Purdue since 2019. Uh, recruiting had fallen off. NIO was down. It, it was just, it was time for a change. So they bring in Kirk Signetti, uh, who has an unbelievable record, even though it's not at a power four level, but he's worked his way up from uh, Indiana university, Pennsylvania, um, to Elon, to James Madison, and he had James Madison undefeated in top 25 with game day uh, there last year, uh, ended up with two losses, went to the Armed Forces Bowl against Air Force. He comes in, they had basically 50 guys in the portal, um, brought back about half the guys they wanted to bring back, uh, including, and, and then they go get and revamp the roster. Uh, with portal guys, including the 2022 Mac Player of the Year, Offense Player of the Year, and Curtis Rourke. Um, you bring in a lot of JMU impact players, Eliza Surratt, that thousand yard receiver. Um, you bring in both starting linebackers, Jalen Walker and Aiden Fisher, James Carpenter, who um, had, I think, 17 and a half tackles for loss. Mikel Kamara, defensive lineman, also had a ton of tackles for losses. Uh, he brings most of his coaching staff uh, with him, uh, both coordinators, uh, Pat Coons, defensive line coach, who's, uh, you know, 
worked his way up from he was a grad assistant at IU, went to become a full time coach, worked his way up from VMU all the way up, made it to James Madison. They led, I believe, they led the country last year in tackles for loss. Um, you know, one of the better D lines in, in the country. You bring in a, a ton of talent in the wide receiver room too. Uh, besides Surratt, you get Miles Price, um, Miles Cross from Ohio, who has a connection with Curtis Rourke. Uh, Donovan McCulley came back from the portal. He was looking at offers from Penn State and a lot of big schools. EJ Williams, who's a Clemson transfer. Uh, Played last year, hurt his thumb in a freak thing during the game, but it was really coming on at the end of last year. He's back. Omar Cooper Jr. is back um, there. And then you get some running backs, Kaylee on Black from JMU, um, Elijah Green from UNC, and uh, Justice Ellison from, from Wake Forest. So the running back room is, is pretty deep. Uh, the offense, Indiana's offense has been terrible you know, from 2021 through 2023, the offense should look much different. And, you know, that offense coaching staff is very good. Uh, on defense, you bring in, uh, you know, the secondary needed to be rebuilt. Defensive line needed to be rebuilt. Uh, and, and you bring in a freshman All-American in, in D'Angelo Pons uh, from, from JMU. And uh, it's just, you know, he he's taken – the great experiment, and I know we're not going to get into a group of five, power four argument here. We don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but it, it is – IU fans have called it the, the, the group of five all-star team. And as we all know, um, group of five teams are better than than people think, especially at the skill positions. And Indiana's done very well bringing in some, um, some secondary players who are all – Sun Belt or, you know, all whatever group of five conference they were from. And, you know, we'll see how they perform at that power four level. Uh, luckily for Indiana, their their schedule does not start off with Ohio State this year. It, it starts off with Florida International. Um, and it's a, you know, a manageable schedule early on to where you could don't have to throw these guys into the super deep end off the high dive. Um, you could use, you could go into the shallow end of the pool, get them used to, to playing power four uh, football and, and get their confidence up with a few early wins. But yeah, it, it's totally revamped. Um, NIL is up. They're, they're moving the student section and the stadium to, to one of the, to the North end zone and stuff like this. So there, there is some momentum in Bloomington. How long it lasts is depends on how many games Kirk Cignetti could win you know, in September and October before you get into the, the real meat of that schedule late October into November. Cool. So, and that's nice to know about the team coming up. So you said they're moving the students to the North and can you tell us what the stadium is like on a game day? When IU was good and we saw it in 2021, um, if you go back to watch the Cincinnati game uh, where IU probably should have won that game, uh, you know, they, they had three trips inside the 10 yard line and got, came away with zero points. And you lose that, um, you, you lose that game by 10 points. And Michael McFadden gets ejected for a, a ticky tack targeting in the first half. But when, when that stadium is full, it's a great atmosphere. It, it's loud. The, the way the stadium is is situated, uh, it, it only holds fifty two thousand, uh, but it's a loud fifty two thousand um, with the incline of, of the stand and stuff like that. Normally, it, it's you know half full. You know there there are diehard Indiana football fans that go to every single game. The problem is it's the same 20 to 30,000 people every time. And they just haven't captured that momentum to, to get, you know, the renewable resource of the students to get them to be season ticket holders and come back and, you know, grow that, that base of 20 to 30,000 people to where, you know, you get a good atmosphere every Saturday. Okay. And, if someone were to travel to Bloomington, what are some traditions to keep an eye out for? Uh, some traditions, well, tailgating is, is big at IU. Um, it might not be as big as some of these SEC tailgates or, you know, one from down south. 
But tailgating's big. It, the uh, team wa- walks from Assembly Hall to the football stadium. Uh, they call it the walk. That, that's a cool tradition. Um, you know, it's usually not super crowded, so you could get – if you have kids, you could get up close. You get players and coaches high fives. Uh, that's pretty cool. And then, um, I mean, they do the victory flag after they win and and stuff like that. But there's really not many traditions where you go, okay, I have to stop what I'm doing and do this, uh, which, is, which is kind of a shame because that's what college football is. It, it's all tradition. And, and stuff like that. I remember when I was a student, they did something before the night before the Purdue game where, you know, they, they buried their version of a Purdue mascot in, in the tailgate field. And it was, it was fun. People were fired up, but that was, that was like a one-time deal. So nothing has stuck um, really in terms of tradition, but that's, if you're not winning, you know, a lot of the traditions just go away. Now, uh, you mentioned the victory flag. For those of us that are not familiar, um, what is that? There's a giant flagpole that former AD Fred Glass put in, and it was like 125 feet tall. So after IU wins, they'll raise a, a giant IU flag um, and, and have it up for the rest of the week until, until the next game or the next loss. So it's something as a, hey, kind of like the, what the Cubs do with the W flag. Is that hey, oh hey did, did IU win to win this week? If the flag's flying, yeah, they, they did. So you know they they kind of borrow stuff from from other organizations, but that one is you know it's kind of cool. People stay after to to watch it get raised, and, and other schools have their versions of it, like Ohio State with the victory bell and and stuff like that. Now, is it raised by players, coaches, or is it just uh, grounds crew? Just grounds crew. Oh, okay, I you never know with the way college football is. All sorts no, of but that happen. would be cool to have like the player of the game uh, to to raise it up. But no, they go and after a win, they'll go and and sing to the student section and the fight song and and then to the parents too. So okay, and um, I gotta ask because I know it's been hinted at it, but who are the rivals for Indiana as far as in football? Uh, Purdue's the number one rival in, in all the sports. Um, you know, second is is probably Kentucky if we're talking basketball and stuff like that. But they haven't played in forever. Uh, the two trophy games are the old Oak and Bucket with with Purdue, and then the old Brass Spittoon, uh, which I actually wrote an article on when I first started my site that got picked up by a, a, the New York Times on one of those odd trophy lists and, and stuff like that. So um, that has become more of a rivalry lately. Uh, because the Who's that with? series, Michigan State. Okay. Yeah, it's with Michigan State. Um, and and since that series has become closer and, and games have been uh, more competitive and they, they played every year when they were in the East, it's become more in focus as a rivalry. Um, but it's still Michigan State still dominating that rivalry uh, historically and stuff like that. And who knows with the new schedule and, and rotations that might not be in every year rivalry anymore. It's not a protect rivalry. Purdue is. Um, what I'd like to see is Indiana and Illinois play more. There's a natural border war right there. Um, I mean, you could say the same thing about Northwestern, but in order to have a rivalry, you have to be pretty competitive with each other and, and build up that, that hate. So it's uh Few and far between rivalry games, but Purdue is the biggest one at the end of the year for the old oak and bucket. Awesome. Yeah, I wasn't exactly sure. You know, I know you mentioned Kentucky. I knew they probably weren't in football since I don't recall they, too many. They, they used to play, and Indiana owns the, the all time series. I think it's 18, 17, and one. They used to play for the Bourbon Barrel. And then a couple uh, Kentucky students died in a drunk driving accident. So they got rid of the Bourbon Barrel, but they still played. And the last game in that series was in 2005. But that was a – they used to play Kentucky in all sports. And that's another border war. They hated each other and, and stuff like that. But that those are those are the rivalries we miss in college football because people get greedy and want to play an extra conference game and don't really want to roll the dice playing another P4 school where you might take a loss. 
Right. And I, I will say this, uh, and every once in a while, uh, I'll interject on a, you know, Florida perspective, uh, when I do these, it's interesting because Florida got a bunch of, uh, hate for not doing too much of it. Now I will say this, we should play more out of conference than we have over the last like seven, eight years. Cause we always had Florida state in the nineties. We were facing a top five Florida state every year, but this year this is the point I'm making is this year. It's funny. It ended up now we have 11 power five games because UCF went up and Miami is, uh, you know, possibly on the uptick Florida state last year really had a great year. So Sometimes it's like, yes, we want the rivalry games like Florida added Miami, but sometimes it's be careful what you wish for because you might end up with just a killer schedule out of it. Uh, but you, you but know, yeah, you can leave, sure. the, leave the state for out of conference games, right? You, you don't you have know, to put all of them in Florida. That That is true. Um, just because Syracuse handed it to you in the 90s doesn't mean you can't go anywhere yeah. else. True. I mean, we were in Utah last year. We played in Dallas in 2017. But that's true. When, I forgot about when you're ones. facing, you know, a top five Florida State team. If people want to argue, we should go play a good for nothing Duke team in the 90s. I mean, I guess it's an argument. Uh, but with that said, would I like to see some of these rivalries that we or out of conference games like a Ohio State, Oklahoma? or a, you know, Alabama, I think, as Ohio State this year, um, Georgia Clemson type, uh, you know, games. I would love to see those uh, a little bit more for Florida. Granted, again, we have some of those set up now. We've got Notre Dame set up. Colorado got set up a few years ago, NC State. But it's just sometimes they all end up uh, converging this year on – into an 11 power fives get or power four, whatever we want to consider the pack to uh, schedule. But uh, before we move on to talking about your Indiana story, uh, one question I ask anyone that comes on is if you could describe the culture of Indiana in one word, what would that be? Indiana football or Indiana in general? Uh, whether you want to say, uh, the culture of Indiana athletics or Indiana football, whichever you would like. Um, Indiana football is, they're still trying to figure out who they are and what they are. And I think that that speaks to the athletic department as well. It's always been basketball. Um, there's, there have been years where IU has been good at football and, but they're few and far between and, and they haven't capitalized on, on those seasons. Uh, but it's always, it's, it's it's like Parks of Rec with Ron Swan. It's Bobby Knight and basketball, and um, you know there's still a large contingent of the fan base who don't understand how important football is, and they still don't. Even with all the stuff that's going on um, on the periphery, with you know conference realignment, with um, you know the uh, revenue sharing and and TV money and all that stuff, they don't realize that hey you need to have a good football program. They don't need to play for national championships or stuff like that, but there, there's no reason that every so often you could play and get into the playoff based on the schedule in the Big Ten and, and stuff like that and the expanded playoff, which is going to go from 12 to however many teams, you know, people could afford. So they're still figuring it out. And I don't want to say non-existent because they're – there is, it's a culture of losing. It, it's kind of like the Chicago Cubs before 2016. If you told me, if you told a, an average IU fan that they were beating Ohio State by 14 points with, with a minute and a half left, they'll go, okay, how did we lose? That that was the culture. And Kirk Signetti's coming in, kind of changing that mind, trying to change that mindset um, of, of the players and the fan base, but um, it, it's got to be proven on the field. So what would you say for that one word? Non-existent. Non-existent. Okay. 
just curious because we've gotten some interesting words like lunch pail was the culture of Virginia Tech. I believe grit we got last week from Kennesaw State. So I'm always curious to see what the different perspectives are around the nation and the different regions. Um, unfortunately, Washington, I was not asking that question yet in episode one. So uh, we still need to get back out to the West Coast. Hopefully someone in takes my invite soon. Um, but anyways, let's uh, get on to your story, Sammy. What can you tell me about uh, your personal fandom with the Hoosiers? Uh, so I grew up in New York City. So Indiana was not like the college football, first college football game I went to. It was Columbia games in the Ivy League. And um, we had family friends with Jerry DiNardo, who SEC fans are familiar with during his time at Bandy and LSU. So, um, you know, I, my first college football, real college football experience was at an LSU Notre Dame game down in Death Valley. Automatically hooked. Um, went the next year to the the return game up in South Bend and all that's automatically hooked. Um, so when he got the Indiana job, I was a, it was 2002. So uh, I think it's sophomore or junior in college or not in college, in high school. So I was starting to look at schools and stuff like that. And I know I wanted to get out of New York, experience the rest of the country a little bit. And if you go to Bloomington, it's hard not to fall in love with the campus. And so I went out uh, 2003, was the first game out there, went to IU Purdue. Um, Purdue won 23-16, but it was like a good game, beautiful day. Campus was awesome. I was like, okay, let, let's get this. This is where we're going. Um, went. Ultimately, he gets fired after 2004, uh, but still was like, okay, IU. I still know a bunch of my high school friends who, who went there and played um, and stuff like that. So that's how I ended up at IU. And then it's just natural that I was rooting for IU football. I wasn't going to root for anybody else. And, you know, I'm one of those rare people who's probably a bigger IU football fan than an IU basketball fan. And during your time of being an IU football fan, uh, and it is interesting how you became a fan. I mean, we've got plenty of people who became fans from becoming students. We've had people that, you know, were students before their football program uh, existed in the case of um, Georgia State uh, here at the College Shuttle. But what would you say uh, some of your favorite Indiana football many uh, memories are. Oh, they're, they're a bunch, and um, you know the first ranked win was in two thousand six over um, over Iowa, and and that was a fun game being there a, a, as a student. And yeah, I, I watched some of they beat Wisconsin two thousand two, uh, but watching on TV is totally different. Um, you know that that game was awesome going the next year to Kinnick and beating them and seeing Kellen Lewis do the back or front flip into the end zone. That was pretty cool. Um, and then, you know, winning the, the, my favorite game was a 2007 bucket game. So for those of you who don't know, Terry Hepner was, I use coach from 2005. Uh, and then until 2006, he had a brain tumor, ended up passing away in the summer of 2007. So his, goal was to to play 13 at IU so to play in a bowl game and in 2007 you brought in Bill Lynch who you know was the interim head coach and they got off to a great start um and they were six and five heading into the bucket game at the end of the year it was a sold out game it was 330 Big Ten Network was there and this was when like the 330 game on Big Ten Network was a big deal um and they needed to win that game because it was this was still a time where six and six didn't guarantee you a bowl game you were bowl eligible but if you went six and six that year i think northwestern went six and six that year and didn't make it to a bowl so to get that seventh win iu jumped out to a big lead purdue came back again it's that uh oh here we go again mindset that i was talking about well with like 20 seconds left Austin Starr, the kicker, kicks a 49-yard field goal to take a 27-24 lead. Place goes bonkers. 
Um, you know, then, you know, the kickoff happens, they throw it around and fumble it and the game's over. Students rush the field. You get the, the old Oak and bucket for the first time um, since 2001. You clinch a ball game and, and it, that, it was awesome. That if you could bottle that and, and make that the Indiana football culture, you, you're cooking with gas. Awesome. Awesome. And so obviously your favorite game, do you have a favorite player uh, from Indiana in your time watching the Hoosiers? Oh uh, yeah. Well, it's cause I, I went to high school with him as John Pinozo. Um, and, it, and if you want to YouTube him, he has some awesome hits on, on a Michigan punt return ones that would not be legal these days. Um, but <laughs> I mean, it, like Superman into a punt returner and just cleaned his clock and stuff like that. But he, he's, he's a good dude. Um, he, he played at the high school I went to. So automatically had a connection and he, he's just tough as nails. He started at fullback as a freshman, as a 17 year old in the big 10. And, um, it, you know, it, it, he scored a touchdown against Ohio state, ripped the ball out of Ted Ginn jr's hands and, and stuff like that. So, um, He's probably my all-time favorite player. Awesome. And, yeah, it's pretty cool, again, things, the more uh, this series goes on, hearing why people have favorite players. And I've got to say, going to high school with with them is a first for the hosts that we've interviewed so far. Uh, So congrats on that. Uh, I know one of my brother's favorite player so i know he's gonna listen probably say no he's not but one of my brother's favorite gators is a guy he went to high school with um or at least that's what my mom would tell everyone when that guy was running all over the field (laughs) so um so for the future of uh you and your uh fandom of Indiana, what are some things you're hoping for in the future? Uh, it can be on the field stuff, off the field stuff. Uh, what are some things, hopes for the future you have? Um, and both on the field and off the field. I mean, obviously, you want to win on the field. You want Kirk Signetti's staff to work uh, and, and things like that and start. Look, I, I know he's not going to be there forever. He's turning 63, and then there's, you know, a clock on how long he's going to be at IU. But if, if he could, you know, create the culture of winning and kind of like what Bill Schneider did at Kansas state and and turn that program around and and hopefully doesn't take two other hires and a return from retirement to find the next guy. Um, But um, to, to build that and then off the field, it's, can you get your ducks in a row to succeed in what college football is becoming? Can you get your NIL in line? Um, Can you, you know, redo the stadium to where you're, you're generating more revenue and updating it to where it's you know fans want to go it's not oh we have to go sit in the stadium it's let's we had a great time the facilities are nice and all that stuff so they need to redo some of that and and revamp some of that and and invest in football which they have they've done a better job um but they were also 30 30 years behind the times uh and and it takes a lot to catch up but it's just pushing football to the forefront and and a lot of that's going to have to do with winning on the field too for sure so let's go ahead and switch it up a little bit go ahead and tell us about your podcast the hoosier huddle yeah um so it's a website and the podcast is is part of the website i started the website in 2020 or 2013 uh and it was a pet project between one of my buddies and myself. I was in grad school at the time. And, you know, I, I, he's an Ohio state guy and into college football. And, uh, you know, we, we thought to ourselves, well, nobody covers Indiana football the way we want to cover. So we just decided to do it ourselves. Uh, and that first year it, it was right. Kevin Wilson's offense starting to click and you, you went five and seven. Um, uh, and we came in at the right time. Uh, you know, the podcast started in 2014 as part of the website. It started as just me interviewing guys on recruiting. And then it, it's now, you know, we, we try to do a weekly show during the season and put out, you know, a couple, couple podcasts a month during the off season. Uh, but 
you know, the, the website, I have three or four uh, writers who work for me as well. I have an internship program through IU. Uh, we're credentialed. We're in the press box. I do the stats for the radio broadcast for IU. So I travel to all the games. Um, and Learfield actually pays for most of that travel, so which is awesome. awesome. Um, so it, it's it's it started as a hobby and it's kind of blown up to okay now now it's too big to just say uh, we're we're done and and hand it off to somebody else. But it, it's been a lot of fun. Met a lot of good friends and, and good people. Uh, doing it and had a lot of fun trips to bowl games and all that stuff. So, yeah, we came in at the right time. Now that That's awesome. I've got to say, uh, I think you might be one of the first people I know that actually gets paid to do the stats for the radio broadcast. And also one of the first podcasts I've talked to that is older than uh, Kennesaw State's football program, uh, which started nice. in 2015. So, all sorts of uh, diversity here in the college huddle of experience and, and what all we do outside of uh, podcast or what all uh, links we have. So uh, in your, I guess we're going on the 12th season of Hoosier huddle. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The 12th, se- 12th season of Hoosier huddle. Um you, you know, we, we've grown our Twitter, Twitter or X following as well. Um, you know, we we have a loyal reader fan base, and you know, we're always looking. You know, if you like college football and you like the Big Ten, we put out stuff that pre, that previews opponents. Um, and if you want to learn about IU football too, I, you know, we, we probably cover it the best out of out of anybody in terms of detail and and things like that. So it, it's it's a place to go for IU football. We are the only IU football only site out there. Now in your 12 seasons covering, what would possibly be your favorite uh, interview or memory related to the podcast? Oh, I, well, there, there's one disaster one where I, was, I had a player, a former player lined up to do an interview on the podcast and I hear my wife shout in the background, oh, F. Well, our base, our sump pump stopped working in the basement when it was flooded. So that podcast didn't happen. So that, that was, that's, that, that's a memory there. Um, I th- coming back from the Foster Farms Bowl, doing the pie post game podcast from Denver Airport. Um, you know, that, that was fun. Uh, the game was fun. The trip was fun. And then just, just sharing all those memories and, uh, you know the the people we we have a tailgate uh, of, of people out there too. So, you know those those are the moments that are more fun. Um, and then just the COVID season. I mean, that was a, IU went six and two. Being being able to be in the stadium to see them beat Michigan, uh, to see them beat Penn State, and um, you know go up and and beat Wisconsin too. That that was to to be one of the few people actually there. It, it was pretty cool that that is cool uh i say that as someone who got to attend quite a few home and away games uh that year by no big 10 was big on the no fans rule uh for the most part up up there um no but that that is cool to get some big wins over big programs like michigan wisconsin uh you know the bigger names in the big 12 so what are some hopes you have for the future of uh, the Hoosier huddle? Uh, just continuing to do what we do and, and maybe modernizing it a, a little bit, build our, our YouTube uh, fan base, be uh, more interactive. Interacting with the fans is, is what I enjoy the most. I, I love talking to Indiana football. That's why we started the site. Uh, and to, you know, to interact with people politely. Now there are some people clowns on social media, um, Always. but to have, but to have that intelligent conversation about college football and we might not agree on things, which is fine. Um, but to be able to intel, you know, maturely and intelligently converse about stuff, maybe we disagree on in terms of IU football, that's always what we're trying to do. So I, I know we have a, a college huddle discord that, that we're trying to build up for Indiana. So if you, if you go in that bear with us, we'll, we're, 
trying to to interact with that um, as well. And then, man, just comments on the site. Interact. We interact on Twitter all the time as well. So. Yep. Now, speaking of interacting on Twitter and trying to build up all of that, where can we find you on the social medias? Yeah, on uh, so on X, uh, we are at Hoosier underscore huddle. Uh, I was not fast enough uh, to, to get the at Hoosier huddle without the underscore in there. Um, and then you can find us on YouTube as well. Um, it, it's a long slug, uh, but it, YouTube.com, just type in Hoosier huddle. And we're in there as well. And then, uh, you know, anywhere you can subscribe to the audio only podcast too on Apple Music, uh, Spotify, Amazon, where, wherever you get your podcasts too. So we, we put them both on YouTube and on um, and an audio only version that, that could be downloaded on, on the podcast apps. Awesome. And before we get out of here, a little bit of a speed round. The first question is there are rumors right now, whether the big 10 would want Florida state or not, if they get out of uh, the ACC as a big 10 guy, uh, what would you think about that? Uh, um, man, I would, I'd hate it. I hate where college football is going. Um, I wouldn't mind adding Florida state, but it just, that's going down a road that I don't want to go down and it's watering down you know, it's a regional sport and you're going to lose right. that as you become a more national conference. Right. And I, I will say I definitely have the same feelings uh, sort of about our new additions to the SEC and with Big 12's additions of Oregon, Washington, USC, UCLA, because it was so great having your different regions, like you said, where you have your Pac-12, Big 10, your big Midwest with the big 12 and sec and then the ACC mostly up the Atlantic seaboard. So it'll be very interesting to see where college football goes. It's not all positive. I mean, it is what it is. Unfortunately, the best we can hope for is that there may be some positives like new rivals. Uh, and I say that like, who knows, maybe, Indiana, Oregon becomes a thing just because somehow they end up on your schedule every year and now you're competing with Dan Lanning and the Ducks. <laughs> hey, Indiana's last trip to, to Eugene in 2004 was an IU win. So, see, exactly. There we go. Sammy's pointing it out, and there I am just setting him up. And that was yep. not talked about beforehand. And look at that perfect uh, nope. softball thrown his way to knock it out of the park. So uh, before we get out of here, is there any anything else you'd like to say about your podcast, yourself, uh, the Hoosiers? I just enjoy college football season. Uh, hopefully this is not the last one um, that doesn't get ruined by, you know, private equity and all that stuff. Enjoy it. And hopefully that the people in charge realize that, um, you know, the average fan should matter more than than what they're doing. So enjoy it. There'll be Big Ten after dark as as well, and you know soon we'll we'll have, hopefully once the games begin, all this other stuff goes away for a little while. For sure. And one thing popped in my head, and I meant to ask you about this. For people like myself that did not know that Indiana was Eastern Time Zone, that's really shocking to me. Since like I think I had messaged you that Florida's not all in the Eastern time zone it's itself. What time does the sun set there in the summer then if it's that far West? It was still, it's still light out right now at eight 45. Um, I went out last night at like 10 and it's still kind of like twilighty. Um, but the official sunsets like at nine 17. Um, it is growing up on the East coast on the Eastern time eastern end of the eastern time zone yeah. it is so it is so weird um to do that but there are spots in indiana that are on central um up by chicago and then i think down by evansville um and, and stuff like that but yeah when i when i was a freshman in college there was no change in the clock it was i think you were eastern eastern time zone until like the fall and then central time zone the rest of the way so okay yeah, it, 
threw me for a loop. I, I was actually up in Ohio a few weeks ago visiting some of their amusement parks. And I'm like, man, they, they're really, their sunsets late. And then you told me, Hey, Indiana, um, we're Eastern time zone. I thought it's gotta be so much later than for them, <laughs> for them. Yeah. You're, you're not the first one to ask. Even my mom still says, oh, what time zone are you still on? So, yeah. Well, with that said again, thank you, Sammy. It's been a whole lot of fun. Thanks for coming on why we huddle. And for everyone that's checking us out, be sure to check out Sammy and the Hoosier Huddle and everything else that the College Huddle has to offer, uh, whether it's the website, collegehuddle.com, or just the various uh, podcast episodes, whether it's Why We Huddle, SEC Huddle, uh, G5, Big Ten, all sorts of things. And with that said, once again, thank you for listening and discovering Why We Huddle. (laughs) 